can come in and take that iron, feed it back to the soil. It's just that you yourself, with your personality and your history and your son, you're gone. Right? And that took a lot of dynamism to keep alive. So you may not have reached the point of zero entropy, which we will never reach until everything dies at the same time, but you're certainly a hell of a lot more entropic than you were when you were alive and swinging. Right? But if the world is, is diversion, you know, like wouldn't it be a contradiction to say that, that entropy even exists? Well, no, because you can see it locally. You, you can see that when a battery, when, a, you know, when, a, when you buy a battery and you put it, you know, of course, iPods and so on have it come with their own batteries, but let's assume that they were like Walkmans still yeah. around, right? You buy two batteries, you put them on, they, are, they have plenty of energy because there are intensive chemical differences inside. You use your Walkman, 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 you begin exhausting that energy at the, the point where you try to turn on your Walkman and it doesn't turn on. The batteries inside have entropy. Mm -hmm. Of course, in the surroundings there's still plenty of energy and so on, but that doesn't mean that the battery, that you can you reuse those batteries. Mm -hmm. Those batteries are dead because inside of them there's entropy, it's pure disorder. All the, the best you can do is throw them away and buy new batteries. I'm just curious about the graphic representations that you presented, because they are they're representations of mathematical data, right? Yeah. Is that what you're well, mathematical equations, yeah. So when you're talking about they do not resemble all the things that can come out of them, that is because they are mathematical data, right? Yeah. And they can't resemble anything. Maybe. Well, but it is similar to, say, when you put your, you connect your heart to an electrocardiogram, and the, the, the machine is just measuring the degrees of freedom of your heart. Its temperature, the, the amount of electrical voltage, you know, it has four or five degrees of freedom in your heart. And it gives you, right? And clearly that doesn't resemble the heart. But it is, it is, create, it is, it is capturing the pattern of change that those variables in your heart are following. You just gotta stay away from the because at that point there's no way it's not coming back, man. If you go into the you know, then someone needs to start shutting your ear. Stay away from the bright light. Stay away from it. Come back. So clearly, we are trying to capture an abstract dimension, which is not the heart itself but the ways in which the, the, the variables that control the heart, the voltage, the, the, the pressure of the blood, the temperature of the blood, and so on, interact together <coughs> to produce this live signal. You know, and they put, it to, they put you in the hospital with this thing, but they need to be checking whether you're dead or not, right? The moment you get that, that that's bad news, you know? Like the patient has died. So, but, so, but the important thing is to, is to realize that the reason they don't resemble what they incarnate, what they actualize, is because we are extracting an abstract pattern from it, which is what we wanted to begin with. We're not saying science discovers hearts. We're saying science discovers the pattern of becoming of hearts. Which is the spiritual dimension? Really? Well, it's the spiritual dimension that I'm going to get, in particular now that you're there here. Now let's see where you would go. No, I'm just kidding. Let me draw then another another diagram. I'm going to start. This is a definitely just a metaphor. That base plane that I'm drawing here is what is called the plane of eminence. A multi-dimensional plane. made out of all the face spaces of all the entities in the whole universe. So imagine that you take the face space for a pendulum has two dimensions, and the face space for a bicycle has six dimensions, and the face space for the human body has a hundred dimensions, the face space for this, the face space for that. There's all the spaces with all these different dimensions. You lay them out on a plane with varying dimensions, and what you get is what Lewis calls the plane of eminence. He also calls this the machinic phylum. 
he also calls this the plane of uh, consistency, he also calls it the body without organs, don't ask me why he changes the words every time, you know. I, I stick to that name because it, it says what it is. It's the plane of it's what you would get if you took every single face space from every, uh, every creature, every process in the universe and you place them in the, in the same space. That's a space that needs to be immanent to matter and energy. Yet yeah, not a totality. No, and not a totality precisely because it respects the heterogeneity of it. In fact, the plane of immanence itself is an assemblage. An assemblage of heterogeneous diagrams. Which is a, a nice way to avoid that convergent, divergent uh, flip-flopping. That's right. Now, uh, and now I'm going to be quoting from a chapter in A Thousand Plateaus called The Geology of Morals which, as everybody can see, is a play of words on Nietzsche's The Genealogy of Morals. But what he now Deleuze is trying to say is we're going to get our ethics from the mountains. We're going to get our ethics from geological strata. We're going to go beyond Nietzsche and ask for an ethics and ask the mountains in their, in their two billion years of age you know, and their wisdom, you know, what do you have to teach us about how to live our lives? So, he uses geological terminology. In particular, he, he talks, the plane of immanence is the plane of spirituality, topological diagrams, and everything that accumulates on top of the plane of immanence he calls strata. Now, the word strata, when you look it up in the dictionary, it refers specifically to a geological event. It means, when, you know, when you're driving down the road, and you see this as the exploded side of the mountain that someone had to blow up in order to build a road, and you see these bands, you know, sometimes a, a red band followed by a black band followed by a white band, just bands of minerals perfectly nicely arranged. And you go, how, how did they do that? I mean, did they paint them on? Or, you know, how did those it, it perfectly arranged pebbles of the right size and the right composition ended up there? Those, those layers are called strata. Each one is one stratum. The way they are formed is through rivers acting as a sorting device. What happens is that pebbles fall from mountains, they fall into a river, the river begins transporting the pebbles toward, toward the sea, but the pebbles that are very, very tiny they almost dissolve in the water and travel very fast with the water. The pebbles that are medium size, they kind of bounce up and down the bottom of the floor, so travel a little less, a little less fast. The larger pebbles, they get dragged along the bottom of the river, and all of those pebbles, now sorted out by speed, get deposited at the, at the bottom of the ocean, when the river reaches the ocean, in the form of sediment. And at the bottom of the ocean, they get glued together by a glue called silica, and then they become layers of rock that are nicely arranged in layers, because it's the river that sorted them out in layers, that are at the bottom of the ocean. When, two, a geolo when plate tectonics clashes two continents against one another, it falls those layers of rock at the bottom of the ocean, brings them up, and creates a folded range of mountains, like the Himalayas, like the Alps, like the Rocky Mountains, in which you can now see the strata, and you get mystified by how the hell they got there. But, of course, there's a whole story, a whole history of how they got there. They began as loose pebbles, they were sorted out into layers by a river that, took a, that, that, that translated size into speed, they were deposited and glued together at the bottom of the ocean, and then eventually became folded by the collision of two plates in, 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 in plate tectonics, and they became the Himalayas with its strata, they became the Alps with its strata, they became the Rockies with its strata. And just the nomadic scientists who, who sort of put this theory forth in the 60s, is like, it's, I think it's an example of your point on nomadic Yeah, absolutely because he was not taken seriously for a long time.